Aloha. It's May the 5th, 2021. Welcome to What Now America. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. And today's topic, today's title is Biden's American Family Plan, $1.8 trillion. Let me go right to our guests and dive into this topic. With me today is Jay Fidel, Stephanie Dalton, and Winston Welch. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, Jay, there is a lot, and I mean a lot, to unpack with the um, American Families Plan. We're, we're looking at $1.8 trillion proposal. Uh, Joe Biden is putting this uh, right up there with the um, infrastructure plan. Uh, they have listed, I, I've got almost a page and a half of bullet points of what this plan entails. So let's unwrap this a little bit and then uh, let's, let's kind of dissect it and go from there. You know, we got um, <clears throat> a proposal to provide two years of uh, community college education. He's proposing a two hundred billion dollar um, package for that that plan alone that will will address um, some of that. Uh, excuse me, one hundred nine billion. I take that back, and uh, an increase of eighty billion dollars in Pell grants uh, that already you know that's how a lot of students go to school now is with Pell grants. <clears throat> He's uh, introducing the idea that uh, three to four year olds will have preschool. And that uh, there's correlations between kids in early preschool and how well they do in kindergarten, and then therefore in uh, the first grade. So uh, that's the two hundred billion dollar uh, package plan, a part of the uh, to, to help that along. And uh, he thinks that'll save the average family thirteen thousand dollars that have kids, uh, rather than paying the daycare out of their own pocket. He has proposed an extensive uh, cut of support for low and middle class income families and a plan not to, um, that no family would pay more than 7% in childcare. I mean, that's, if you know, if, for those families out there, those parents, they know how much uh, daycare is. Uh, certainly they're paying a lot more than 7%. So this subsidy would uh, greatly, greatly uh, enhance those households. And I guess the theory is that um, that allows people to work full time and and um, not have the daycare eat into their their budgets. Uh, he's proposing oh, to train teachers, $9 billion to train teachers to really prepare them and, and get a better, you know, a more proficient a line of teachers to prepare for the 21st century. Uh, we have uh, the health tax insurance credit, uh, 1.8 trillion of that. He's, he's talking about um, extending the family care credits to 2025. He's talking about uh, earned income credit being enhanced. He's talking about the dependent care and credit, um, all sorts of these things. So those are just a handful of proposals in his family plan. And uh, what, what struck me was this morning he got on and he's at the podium and he said, the plan is being criticized as a welfare plan. He said, nothing further can be the truth. I want to progress the United States. I want to move it forward. I want us to, you know, not be a country that, you know, second class, third class country anymore. He wants to propel it to a first class nation again. And I suppose that plus the infrastructure bill. Um, what do you think about that, Jay? What do you think about uh, the GOP thinking it, it is a, um, a welfare plan, uh, maybe a, an extension of the Great Society from President Johnson back in the 60s? Well, back in the day, I would have said to you, it's too much money, and uh, we can't afford to go in a hole that way. We have, we'll have to pay it back, and it'll be painful to pay it back. But I have completely changed my view of that, personally. And what I see is it, it touches off what you were saying a minute ago, Tim. We have, we have to remake the country. The country has gotten old, and, and it's, it's cracking. <clears throat> it's declining, and we have to throw cash at it. We have, to, we have to achieve a couple of things. One is we have to have a better life for people. Um, the other thing is we have to have an engagement with people. In other words, they should love the government. They should feel the government is part of them, that it cares about them. I've been watching um, the Roman Empire documentary on um, Netflix lately, and it talks uh, in substantial part about the decline of Rome decline of the empire. It was a great empire at once. It stretched for thousands of miles, and it involved millions and millions of people. We don't realize how big it was and how successful it was. Point of view of managing people, managing assets, moving ahead, technology. They were great for a time. 
<clears throat> then they started coming apart. And there were many, many vectors and factors and variables that made them come apart. But <clears throat> part of it was the public wasn't engaging. And the government didn't care about the public anymore. Um, and, and that's where we are now. We have, we have uh, Congress doesn't, you know, in, in bottom line, it doesn't care about the people. Yeah. Um, if we're going to save this democracy, uh, we're going to have to do stuff like this. But the big question, and maybe you can ask uh, Stephanie or Winston about this, is how likely is it that he could get these things passed? I totally agree he should do this. All of it. All of it. Throw money at making us a better country, at making us competitive in the world market, making us a leader. But can he do it? Yeah. You know, two points, do I want to make. And one is um, the Roman Empire was a great empire, one of the greatest empires. Um, brutal as it was, um, but they borrowed from the Greek empire. <laughs> so it wasn't all their initial original ideas. They, they borrowed heavily. Uh, secondly, you know, this plan is really 180 degrees uh, in the opposite direction from what made Ronald Reagan so popular and so successful is that government can't do anything right. So let's get the government out of our lives and let's be self-sufficient and really spur America forward without the hindrance of government. What are your thoughts about the, the departure from the Reagan days and that philosophy, which seemed to be very popular back, you know, back in the 80s? Oh, it was popular. He was a, you know, a great speaker and a great um, you know, propagandist for that notion, for that ideology. But we're, we're way beyond that. In fact, it didn't work. Reagan's plan, you know, Reagan's econ economic uh, you know, system didn't work. Now we have a challenge that's greater than what Reagan had, for sure. We have the country at a tipping point. And you know, I don't know if people fully understand that. I don't know if the administration in Washington fully understands that we are at a tipping point. We must save ourselves. We must take dramatic steps. We must remake America. That's what he's doing. And I hope, I hope he can do it. Because you know, the dark side of this, the ghost of Christmas future, is if he can't do it, and we continue down the same path that Trump has taken and revealed. Um, I think it's going to be like old-fashioned Rome. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jay. Hey, Stephanie, <clears throat> of this family plan, um, do you see any uh, downside to it? Uh, any provisions that, and again, there's many, so we didn't cover them all. But do you see any obvious downside to the plan? And, and if so, why? Go, Joe. No, I, I oh, think okay. I, I like the way he comes on with big, gives him some maneuvering room in, in the event that there were that was needed. But of course, as Rachel Mann made clear last night, uh, Mitch McConnell's already said there will be no one voting for this bill. So that takes a lot of burden off the Democrats to just get on with making it happen uh, through reconciliation. So I think. Uh, you know, before those tunnels in Pennsylvania start dropping down on people, I mean, those things have been a wreck since one of those cross-country trips when I was a kid. You know, things were already uh, not uh, not good. So, and and certainly these um these are not innovative ideas, but these are necessary um uh, um activities is to get the kids into preschool, all the kids, so we can get out from under these kids at third grade, fifth grade, eighth, not not reading because they didn't have a decent beginning and we've just got to pull this education act together to at least be comparable to our international um peers okay um industrial and uh it's just shameful where we are right now and and uh, of course on the other end of the scale then you knew of course they come on about the education i mean getting that community college thing to happen for people so that um, they got a little time to mature because by 16 17 18 when they graduate from high school sometimes nobody's paying attention uh -huh. to anything and so uh you get a little more maturity as you go uh closer to 20 and get in the classroom then with the community college in a different sense of let me let me, let me chime in on, on the points you're making on this uh, now what's not part of this and I think it's a it's a different part of uh, either an executive order um, what what's your thoughts about President Biden potentially canceling existing college debt and if 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 you support it how much should how much of the a student's debt should be canceled all of it some of it um, what kind of institutions should be canceled? That's a really good question, Tim. I, I really don't 
I've really not thought that through. I'm I'm not so inclined towards it um, because, you know, there are a lot of people that didn't get the debt because they didn't go to Princeton or they didn't go to the expensive private institution. You know, that's why we have public university. That's a huge land grant universities that we've had for a hundred years and are the envy of the world that we have these fabulous institutions out there that are doing the same kinds of things as the private and well-funded and endowed ones. So I don't know, that's, that's, that's going to have to get worked out through. He actually, uh, he actually did address it during the, uh, the candidate debates when he was asked a question about uh, paying off more debt, I think, than the proposed $10,000. And he said, absolutely not. So it was my impression that President Biden was more in favor of canceling debt that pertained to community colleges um, or exactly. public state colleges, but certainly not private colleges. Oh, exactly, exactly. Yeah. That, because with the, uh, you know, the comparison to the empires, Greece and Rome, and of course, the, the, it's Athens that's, uh, you know, our democratic model. And they're trying to, you know, re-up the Parthenon and get it fixed so we can all enjoy it for another thousand years. But, um, and then the, in, in the Roman Empire too. So, you know, you, you had more tutoring and that sort of thing going on. And and that's one of the reasons um, those empires were successful is because they were doing the big thinking and the ideas that were driving the way they were working. And then Rome comes and did that too. And um, and then they kind of got away from that with some crazy emperors. But, um, and that was not make that over simple. You mean, I now you've heard the rise and fall of Rome in, in two sentences. <laughs> Crazy emperors, that. crazy <laughs> emperors. We want a crazy emperor. We got a candidate, you know, so we can go that way too. But no, I mean, it's it's just getting this citizenship citizenship uh, uh, up to the to the challenge of being a democracy. I mean, obviously, that's uh, an issue here. We've got to have people who are capable of doing some critical thinking and uh, substantive thinking and uh, understanding. What it takes to to get get an operation like this United States of America or any country or a state, you know, to work and work for everybody in a way to give them the best quality. Can, can I chime in on this issue, if you don't mind? Of course, Jay. Of course. You know, for, forgiving debt is is nice. Everybody will be very happy about that. But but clearly, you know, for the government, the government to achieve a better, more better informed citizenry, the citizenry that can appreciate and and follow on in good democracy, um, it's not that helpful. All it does is alleviate people's debt. Okay, good, but not great. Um, the important thing is to give people an education, people who didn't otherwise afford, be able to afford an education, give them an education now and support that education and support the schools and support programs that make them better citizens. And that's where you know the bulk, I think, of the money should go. It's very important and we have to start right away um, so, you know, uh, paying off debt is one thing, but incentivizing conduct and institutional development uh, to make a better country, you have to look forward, not back. Okay. Uh, Winston, to you, based on Jay's comment just now, and that is, you know, in the, since the Great Society programs back in the 60s, uh, created by President Johnson, um, we have focused a lot of those target dollars towards the disadvantaged, the economically disadvantaged. Um, Joe Biden's message for this this election that he won was, I need to help the middle class get ahead. It's the middle class that's falling behind, not just the economically disadvantaged uh, below the poverty line, but also the middle class. And so these programs are designed not only for the low income, but also the moderate income. Uh, is that the right approach, number one? And number two is, of uh, the family plan uh, proposed by President Biden, what do you think is uh, the most attractive aspect of it? Uh, great questions, Jim. I, you know, the, he's uh, he's hitting this right on the on the head. I think he's appealing to a broad swath of Americans, uh, middle class certainly. Uh, who do, if you've got kids, it's expensive to keep them in daycare. If you're making fifty, sixty thousand a year, it's still expensive to keep them in daycare. The idea of, of having universal preschool, as Stephanie says, as an educator, is proven to uh, lead to long-term benefits for these kids and for our society. So I think while in the past, yes, the, the Great Society had, had appealed towards um, you know, bringing everybody up, this is, this is just part two. And as if you go to the White House uh, uh, website, 
they outline what this is for. And they, they mentioned one thing is that, you know, that it targets also some specific things, uh, uh, historically black colleges and universities, because they disproportionately, even though there are a small number of our colleges, they vastly are disproportionate in the number of judges and, and, and uh, people like that, 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 that come out of these uh, colleges. So uh, it, whether it's tribal colleges or other minority colleges, this is the America that we have today. And we know, let's not kid ourselves, that uh, that if you're a minority in this country, you're still facing some structural disadvantages. They may not be intentional. They may not be in your face, but they're there uh, for whatever reasons. And we, as a society, want to give everybody an equal opportunity. And the way we do that is providing by these uh, equitable solutions. So I think that whether it's uh, earned income uh, tax credits for the child free, uh, being raised, or whether it's uh, subsidies for folks going in uh, in the workforce who need childcare, or you know, it, it's very thoughtful things like like the, the Pell grants or uh, being increased and, and just letting know how expensive college has become uh, for people. And you know what I mean? I, this is a very thoughtful uh, plan. It's not just in, in, including that, but it's including things like paid family leave and bereavement sleep and, and getting this up to sort of civilized standards, you know, uh, it only calls for 12 weeks of paid parental leave. We need two years of paid parental leave or, or y- y- we can afford this as a society. But as you know, as we're looking around at, at the plan that it, it's, it also covers dreamers and DACA. Let's just get rid of that already. Legalize these folks. If it's kids that have been here all their lives, they don't speak another language. They've never lived in another country. Let's get that, that, uh, you know, irritant off the table and just do this. It also includes things like subsidizing nutrition programs when we know that huge numbers of of children in this country are going hungry or not being fed properly. Let's feed them in the schools with food. You know, let me go to that point. It's not just children, but also um, for for those who are incarcerated that are now not incarcerated, uh, the SNAP program is eligible for them. Now, can you hear the GOP, um, you know, running up the wall and back down the wall saying you want a plan that that helps yeah ex-cons that's exactly what we need we need plans in prison training these folks uh with the skill so that they can come out so that it's not a i i I mean if you're going to prison in this country and one out of three people i think is arrested at some point in uh in america if you're in prison it it's a it's criminal justice but out of that justice we also have to recognize that a lot of those people can't even read, to Stephanie's point, that a lot of prisoners never learned how to read or they were born to, to, to crack dependent parents or whatever. So while they may have made poor choices, we as a society, they're being released back to us. So what do we want to do? Do we want to give them the best chance possible despite their offenses? I would argue yes, because otherwise they're going to uh, you know, uh, commit other crimes and go back into the system. And that is not beneficial for us as a society or for them as individuals. So. Absolutely. He's hitting it right on the head here. And and thoughtful things. Like I said, you know, when they look at, at colleges, um, they're talking about wraparound services. So they realize that people have a they might be working during college, but they get fired from their job and they need those extra two months of emergency support. Or maybe they need child care on campus or whatever it is. There's they're very thoughtful programs, I think, that that uh, that he's proposing here. And Obviously, it is a uh, a large expansion of what we've been used to, but in fact, it's exactly what this nation needs because we're making long term investments in our uh, society by starting educating children at three years old, feeding them correctly, and moving on up. Then we're going to have less people going into prison because they're going to be well educated, and their mothers are going to have expanded SNAP benefits. We can afford this as a society. It's we're only talking about it. So you're saying- you're, you're saying it's better to have a pro proactive program than a reactive. What a what a nominal thought in this country. Nominal yeah. thought, and 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 it appeals. He's appealing to people because he's saying if you make four hundred thousand or or less, then your taxes aren't going to go off. He's he's continuing yeah. this tax credit that we got last year, which I think is really quite smart. And <clears throat> and he, I think that that this is not about um, hitting on the wealthy, as uh, was the Chairman Mao said. Uh, to be rich is wonderful or something like that. This is a society that's not going to prevent you from that. We're talking about a tax increase from 36 to 39% for those yeah. people a million bucks. So if you're at that level, is another $30,000 tax really going to kill you or not? 
I don't think so. Um, so being rich, getting wealthy, that's not an issue. That's not what he's fighting against. He's saying we need to raise this whole bottom up so that more educated, rich consumers can buy the, the wonderful products that you're making and Good that point. we have a, an educated workforce that can compete right. on the world stage. Good point. Good point. All good points, Winston. Um, hey. Ladies and gentlemen, Cynthia Lee and Claire. Here's the question, Cynthia. Uh, okay. This, this family plan, do you see any deficits to it? Do you see any, any fault lines? Uh, or do you, do you like the program as is? Uh, Joe Biden said he's willing to negotiate aspects of it and certainly how to pay for it. He's willing to negotiate with Republicans on that. Uh, your general thoughts about the plan and uh, specific things you don't like about it or, or anything you don't like about it. Okay, well, in regards to college being uh, free junior college, two years of college, if Alabama can do it, the country can do it. And Alabama for, I think, 20 years now has provided free junior college. It was a, a Wallace leftover, a George C. Wallace leftover thing he started. Um, so it seems to me that if Alabama, one of the, you know, the poorest states in our country can manage to give kids two years of free junior college, then it seems to me this country can do it also. So um, as far as college goes, as far as daycare goes, I'm absolutely on board um, with everything that Joe Biden has said. My oldest boy spends almost a third of his income on child care. A third. That's a lot. Um, so I think that's just too much. And yet, you know, um, child care workers don't need to have their, you know, money cut in any way. So subsidies are really the only, the only option for that, if you ask me. Um, I, I think about sometimes when I, I hear, uh, you know, the president talking about how he's willing to negotiate. And I think about real estate deals or, or when you sell a car, you always ask for more. <laughs> You, then what you really want, so that when you when you do bargain and come back down, you know you're you're negotiating. And so I'm hoping that's kind of what he's done is sort of added a little bit of a buffer to his uh, ultimate, you know, act, knowing that the Republicans are going to want to knock it down. But in my mind, the Republicans, I don't know, as I think that it's worth trying to negotiate with the the capital that you know our congressional republicans because real human you know regular people republicans are really way on board with this well we got 70 percent that is on board so i think it's the the ones in congress that are are really doing us a disservice and and I'm not quite sure what to do about that. I know there's a lot of talk right now about getting rid of Liz Cheney. And and that that shows everything. They want to oust her because she's not willing to lie. Now, what does that say about every other Republican then? They are willing to lie. And they don't want anybody that isn't willing to lie. And that, to me, says, everything we need to know about the Republican Party and how much they even deserve, excuse me, but, and how much they even deserve to try to work with them. Okay, well, that, let me hit that point, because Joe Manchin said that he's absolutely convinced that the Republicans need to be a part of this negotiation, as with the um, the uh, infrastructure plan. Uh, to what degree is this, this negotiation going to be just for show? I mean, it is going to be a budget reconciliation process, 51 votes. Uh, yeah, they need Joe Manchin for sure. But to what degree is there going to be sincere negotiations versus uh, we tried to negotiate. They wouldn't come along. We're going to vote for budget reconciliation. We're going to do the 51 votes. Uh, what do you think about that? Do you think uh, this is going to be a, a, a drawn out negotiation or is it going to be quick and fast? And it was just for show. I don't think it is just for show. I believe that Joe Biden, honestly, 100 percent believes in bipartisan work and believes in his goal to try anyway to reunite the Senate a little bit and the and well all of Congress, right? 
Um, I believe he is genuine in wanting to do it. And I hope that it will not be drawn out because um, while I believe Joe Biden has good intentions, I don't believe we can trust the intentions of the Republicans. All righty. I'll leave it at that. Jay, your topic, my topic, our favorite topic, taxes. In this case, tax <laughs> increase. <laughs> our favorite, every, every American's favorite topic is taxes. Uh, Joe Biden said this morning that um, those that are impacted are not going to feel any pinch to their wealth. Yeah, it'll be minor inconvenience. But right now, there's 35 uh, Fortune 500 corporations that paid zero taxes. He said, in what country is that right? Uh, he, he mentioned some of the loopholes and how corporations are getting around uh, paying taxes. Uh, this plan addresses uh, the loopholes where capital gains is being uh, used from um, hedge fund uh, you know, CEOs, and they're getting around paying their taxes at 15% versus uh, uh, you know, 39.6%. Um, your thought about how these tax proposals are, are laid out, how they're designed to close some loot holes that have been in place for decades, uh, you think that's fair? You think it's going to work? We need sweeping tax reform in this country. <clears throat> we, we can't let wealth accumulate at such fantastic, fabulous levels as it has been for a very small percentage and let everybody else uh, struggle. You know, when, when Trump came into office, the very first thing he did, and I, I don't know how this happened, really, the very first thing he did is he named, you know, what you name a bill is so important because people judge the whole bill by the name. And if a name is inaccurate, you know, then people are deceived. So he called it the tax reform bill. And uh, I think it was Boehner went along with him. Ryan went along with him. And uh, before you know it, the whole country thought they were going to get a tax reform bill. I'm here to tell you guys, it was not a reform bill at all. It was a deception. Is it a deception of the middle class and the disadvantaged? And it was a gift to the rich and the corporations. And I found that it was extraordinary. It was completely the wrong direction. And, what it, and this is an attempt to roll that back. So I commend him on doing it. I want him to do it. And, you know, I have a, a master's in taxation. So I don't come at this with naive pay. Uh, I mean, on a, on a, on a public um, policy basis, this this is this is this has needed to happen for a long time. But I want to go to one other point before we run out of time here, and that is this. <clears throat> you know, one guy that I know, uh, when the tax reform bill was being proposed, I said, Do you, you support this? And he said, Of course, I have a small business and I'm going to get some money out of this. Uh, it's gonna make it's gonna make my business better, more, more feasible, and you know, I'll do swell under this bill. I said, what about the fact that a lot of people are being screwed by this bill and a lot of people are being you know, inappropriately uh, rewarded by this bill? He said, I don't care about that. I care about my tax return. I care about my economics and I support it. That's my silo. I said, good for you, but um, not good for you. Um, <clears throat> okay, what I'm getting at is that people in this country, and this is why I think we're at a tipping point, are interested in their own welfare. Uh, we had a show about India yesterday, was it? And um, you know, and, and we've seen on the media a lot of the things about India. And we've seen that in India in the time of COVID, there are people who are volunteering to help the dead and the dying. Um, <clears throat> they go out of their way for free. They join volunteer organizations, of which there are many right now in India, to help people with COVID. And so the press asks, um, you know, one person is a volunteer, why are you doing this? Are you doing it for money? No, I'm a volunteer. It's free. I, I do my time. How are you putting in all this time? You're doing it for the community, for your neighborhood, you know, for your friends, for your family. You're doing it for them. He said, no, I'm not doing it for them. Well, are you doing it for India? Are you doing it for the country? He said, no, I don't do it for India. Why do you do it? I do it for humanity. Okay, and my point about all of that is, you can have a silo that says, I'll make a few hundred or a few thousand dollars because of you know, Trump's tax reform bill, and that's for me. I don't care about the rest of you. I do not care about the rest of you. Um, or you can you know, think of your community and work on that silo. Or even think of the nation, which is commendable, and work on that silo. But why can't we work on humanity? This country has lost touch with helping the people, helping the country, 
and helping humanity. We have a long way to go. And Congress is in such a pit over this. It doesn't even understand what I'm saying. <clears throat> so I said before, and I'll close with this. I said before, it's not all that clear that any of Biden's um, you know, liberal bills, which I support completely, we all do, uh, will pass. They'll be fragmented. They'll be turned around in some way where they won't, they won't pass. And this is very troublesome because this shows you we're going down the wrong end of the tipping point. Yeah. Okay. You know, again, this morning, Joe Biden brought up the point you just made, and that is when the corporate tax cut was made from 28% down to, no, it was higher than that, uh, down to 21%. The, the, the big selling point to giving corporations a break was they were going to take all those tax savings and invest back into their employees, either through wages or capital reinvestment. And what did they do? They rebought their spot. They, they, they bought their stock back. And, and they gave themselves it. raises. Don't forget they, that. Yeah, and they gave themselves raises. So that money never really worked fully back into the economy, back into the pockets of Americans. Uh, back into the retail sales. Yeah, it, Reaganomics. Remember, it was Jim, that the fiduciary responsibility of the corporation is to its shareholders. It is not to the nation. It's not to the workers. If it works out in their interest to be so, then that... Well, that's cool. Yeah, that's true. But I also remember that back in the day, when a corporation would reinvest in its capital uh, machinery or things that make it operate better and more efficient and more profitable, that used to be uh, the order of the day what a corporation would do is when they had excess capital lying around, they would reinvest in their own corporation. Uh, yes. Those days seem to be gone. Well, whatever maximizes shareholder wealth is what yeah. the bottom line is. Well, yeah, good point. All right, guess what? Uh, last comments, folks, because we're we've run out of time. But I'd like to get everyone's last comments. Winston, starting with you, last comment. I think we should make West Virginia the richest state in the nation by all means possible. <laughs> Here goes the golden toilets again. <laughs> golden bridges, golden <laughs> toilets, right. golden schools. There you go. Funny. Keep Joe Manchin happy. Keep Joe Manchin happy. Yes. Cynthia, your last comment. Um, let's see. My last comment is I would like to appeal to all Republicans out there to please, um, please open your minds and open your hearts. And then I want to appeal to all Democrats out there. Call your Republican friends. And try to reason with them if you can. Okay. That's an aggressive wish. Okay. <laughs> Stephanie, last that's comment. Thank you, Cynthia. That. Stephanie, an, your last comment. Thank you. I mean, that's a nice thought. I think we've learned uh, about the usefulness of that. I wanted to just make a point again about um, education, the, the amount of money that Tim uh, stated earlier that's given over to the professional development of educators. And I wanna I want to say that without that, this is a matter of Biden's following through and paying attention to the details. Because if we're just paying to get kids babysat again, that is not gonna get us there. So babysitting them from three instead of from five um, doesn't make it happen. We've got to have people that understand what we know about cognitive development, which is other than brain surgery, okay, we now know a lot about it. And it starts that early. And we need to make sure that educators know what they're doing and how to do that for, for all of our kids that have capacity to do so. And I think that Hawaii, the state of Hawaii, is such a good example of this. We, uh, Hawaii has always had child care because women have always worked here. They came and went onto the plantations. There's never been a woman's movement or anything like that that made a difference. The point is that our kids have been in care uh, from very early on and all the way through to um, the end of high school um, and look at where we are with our schools. So the question is, you know, just having the kids covered and, and, and babysat is not going to get us to the critical thinking, the analytic thinking, the ability to make judgments, synthesize, analyze, and make good decisions to be dem dem democracy citizens. So we've got that piece of money is really important that that get in there. So we get these people up to speed. We need quality education, not just babysitting, but we all know how important babysitting is. Well, <laughs> well, you're a life educator. Your career is education. And so your words are very salient and very, very credible. And I thank you for them. Jay, your last comments, please. 
Um, well, Biden's programs make it clear that we are way behind, way behind where we should be, uh, way behind other places in the world in terms of you know developing our nation, developing the the social fabric and the and the relationship of government and the, and, and the citizenry. And so all I can say is what you said at the beginning of this part of the show: we're out of time. We are out of time. You know what? I want to, my last comment is how much I appreciate each and every one of you that you, what you bring to the table on this topic and all the other topics that we've discussed in the past and we'll discuss in the future. We've run out of time. I'd like to thank Jay Fidel, Daphne Dalton, Cynthia Lee Sinclair, which we don't see, but we hear, and Winston Welch. Thank you one and all. Join us next week at 11 o'clock Wednesday for What Now America. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and we'll see you soon. Aloha.